plainly, passing is a privilege. My name is Tony Michelle Williams. I am the executive director of the Solutions Not Punishment Collaborative in Atlanta. We are a Black trans-led organization uh, that focuses on leadership development of Black trans and queer people um, and transformative campaigns. My role in this movement is as an organizer, uh, agitator, a facilitator of change, a facilitator of brilliance, and a healer, again, of hearts and minds of Black people and Black babies. I think that the most important thing people around this country, particularly Black people um, who are not trans, and who, are, and who do not identify as L, G, B, T, or Q, um, is that in order for all of us to get free, we have to hold space and be present with the experiences of everyone who is Black. Well, I am Lauren Jones. I am one of two policy co-chairs for the National Positive Women's Network USA. My reason for being at the HIV um, housing conference today is because I've had a long time interest in both um, homeless issues, poverty issues, and HIV. Um, I have to admit from coming from a standpoint of self-interest, um, I have been homeless um, during the past years. More than 20 years ago, I was actually homeless on the streets and lived outdoors. So I know what it's like to be outside and homeless. I know what it's like to live in other people's houses. And I know what it's like to be finally successfully housed. I also know the challenges of being um, HIV positive, homeless and um, a female. Um, the reason that I come to these kind of conferences, and this one is unique in that it gives me the opportunity to work on um, both issues that I'm very passionate about. Um, my number one hope is that we can get the advocates um, that are involved in both those issues to work together. Hello, I'm Dr. Kimberly Smith, Head of Global Research and Medical Strategy for Vive Healthcare. Today I'd like to provide my perspective on challenges faced by women living with HIV disease and why more clinical trial data specifically focused on women is needed. Despite improvements in antiretroviral therapy and more than 17 million people on treatment, AIDS remains a leading cause of death among women of reproductive age worldwide and 62% of new HIV infections globally are among adolescent women. While Sub-Saharan Africa has the highest proportion of young women living with HIV, it is a significant epidemic among women worldwide. Women living with HIV have unique challenges compared to their male counterparts. These include gender inequality, intimate partner violence, lack of access to health care the potential for pregnancy and possible transmission to the unborn child. Add to this the potential for drug-to-drug -drug interactions should they decide to utilize oral contraceptives or hormone replacement therapy. These are among many issues. As the only company 100% focused on HIV prevention and treatment, Vive Healthcare is committed to improving treatment options for women. We recognize that women are underrepresented in HIV clinical trials. Data also suggests that women may be more likely than men to discontinue clinical trials for reasons other than efficacy, and the rates of certain adverse events can be elevated in women relative to men. Vive Healthcare is committed to adding more clinical trials sp data specific to women to the literature and we will actively contribute to the discussion on how we as a global community can improve the treatment of women living with HIV.
focus is really everything that we can do to try to allow people who are living with HIV to live their best lives. Our model is to leave no patient living with HIV behind. And so the data that we shared is basically more data telling us that you can use fewer medicines and keep HIV under control and that we can dose uh, with less frequency in order to allow people to not focus on their HIV treatment, but focus on living their lives. We flagged National Women and Girls HIV, aware, HIV and AIDS Awareness Day, I think because pointing to a group that people don't really think about as at risk for HIV, particularly in the United States, and when you have something like National Women and Girls HIV AIDS Awareness Day, it's recognizing that there are women who are living with the virus, there are girls living with the virus. Women across the world have a much higher rate. They are, they represent more than 50% of those living with HIV infection. In the United States, it's about somewhere around 20, 22%. But when you look at young women and girls, they're the highest rates of people becoming infected across the world. We often trade one population for another a little bit, looking at, oh, they have a much higher risk, so we have to pay attention. But we can never deliver the message that women and girls aren't equally as important in understanding that they too have risk. And it may not be it may or may not be risk in the sense that we can point to an individual woman or girl, but we have to think about the communities they live in, who are their partners, who are their partner's partners, and what this may mean for their own individual recognition. So if we raise the, the attention that we pay to something like this, we can get women and girls who haven't acquired HIV to perhaps pay closer attention to their ability to protect themselves. We can get providers to pay attention to offering HIV testing, HIV counseling as part of their general health care, and also offering HIV prevention for women who may be at risk. Um, and, uh, and making sure that women who, are, who have acquired HIV are in treatment and are cared for and get adequate information. So I think there's a... We have all of these tools at our disposal for taking care of people. But it's the same problem if you can't get people tested, right? If you can't find out who's positive, you can't treat. But you can't, again, you can't stop with the testing. You have to move on. So after you test, then what? You need to link the care. But it's not just good enough to link to care. Then what do you have to do? You gotta retain people in care. So what? I have an abnormal test. I'm HIV positive. You've linked me to care. You can't stop there, right? And that's where you guys come in. You can't just stop there. The worldwide HIV AIDS pandemic has infected more than 33 million people living today, including 19 million women and 2 million children. Coming up, meet a woman who has found a unique way to bring awareness, prevention, and hope to AIDS-ravaged communities around the world. For 27 years, Cynthia Davis has been fighting to prevent HIV AIDS among women and people of color in South Los Angeles and around the world. 20 years ago, she helped the AIDS Healthcare Foundation establish the first AIDS hospice that served her community. Cynthia started the Dolls of Hope Project in 1998 to organize volunteers to make handmade dolls for AIDS orphans around the world. She also uses the dolls to destigmatize the disease and to educate about its prevention. Lifetime salutes Cynthia Davis for uniting people with her message of hope. Find out more at mylifetime.com. Stigma is probably the thing that's killing more women than any of the issues that's related to HIV. So what I mean by that is that if you feel like you don't want anyone to know that you have HIV, you have medication, 
but you may not take that medication because you don't want anyone to, to see you taking that medication. If you're homeless and you're living um, you know, from place to place, you may make decisions about who you share that information with. And this is important information that is gonna help you to live a, a longer, more healthier life. Um, I have experienced women telling me that because they have HIV, they don't feel that they deserve to be touched or loved. And we know that if you have a baby and the baby is not getting touched, we know that that baby fails to thrive. This is what happens to women because of stigma. They fail to thrive. And it is as much an issue today as it ever was. You can't tell the story of HIV without including San Francisco. But right across the water is another community, a browner community. You can't talk about the future of HIV without looking and seeing what's happening in Oakland. We went from the disease predominantly of gay white males to today. Most of the people who are impacted by HIV in the world are women. It broke my heart to see people of color getting less resources. We're still seeing the same type of less than urgent response by our government and by decision makers. Having the International AIDS Conference in the Bay Area of California, it's extraordinarily exciting. We get an opportunity to talk about the future of HIV and to let the world know how much progress has been made, but how much still remains for us to do. If it weren't for HIV, I'd probably be dead. That was literally my thought as we were speaking about the HIV safety net. Like, I think sometimes I don't have to worry about my medical care, and it makes me, like, want to put tears in my eyes because they take care of me. Like, I don't have to, if, they're, if it's not, like, regular medical that I qualify for, my state has it to where there are programs in place that I don't have to worry about if I would get my medicine or not. This hasn't always been my story because I've lived in other places where they didn't take care of us so much, but there are so many resources. Like I have the case manager. I, they help me, you know, with supplies for my son around school time. Like I know that I can always call somebody and get help in any facet of my life. And that's only because of my HIV status. And I've been positive so like all of my adulthood. So I don't know, I can't even picture a life without having those resources in place. And yes, that's only for HIV. Yeah. I'm Celeste Watkins Hayes, and I'm the author of Remaking a Life, How Women Living with HIV AIDS Confront Inequality. In 2005, I began interviewing women living with HIV. Women talked about the experience of what I call dying from, receiving their diagnosis and interpreting it as a death sentence. Over time, women discovered that they could live with HIV as a chronic, manageable illness. Women were dying from not just HIV AIDS, but many were dying from a whole host of issues, past traumas, what I call the injuries of inequality, such as poverty and racism. So what they were really describing was an experience of dying from a whole multitude of challenges and moving along their trajectory of living with, figuring out how will they create new strategies to not only medically manage their HIV diagnosis, but socially navigate the stigma and socially confront many of the injuries of inequality that had previously hobbled them. that social determinants, 
you know, social factors, the conditions in which people live and work every day are really, really important in health outcomes in general. And HIV is no exception. Social factors are critically important. In the mid 20th century, there was the rise of, you know, so-called risk factor epidemiology, where people became much more focused on the individual determinants, uh, the individual behaviors and characteristics of people that put them at risk for disease. And these things are important. Um, but it turns out that in order to, there's increasing evidence that in order to really make headway with the HIV epidemic in this country and in the world, there's going to need to be more attention paid to some of the social factors that drive people's behavior and also that set them up uh, to acquire infection. Healthcare availability and affordability for all would make a huge difference uh, in terms of transmission of HIV and also in terms of um, also in terms of people's personal health, um, with people who are living with HIV. We need to implement that I and mean, make sure health reform legis health care reform legislation actually does go forward and get implemented. There have been some really very stunning advances, uh, biomedical advances in particular, in HIV prevention during the past few months. I think we need to continue to invest in biomedical research, but we also need to become more convinced about the importance of these social factors in maintaining disparities, these differences in HIV infection in this country and actually throughout the world. And we need to become more invested in correcting these social factors that underpin the spread of HIV infection and really understand that in the final analysis, it will be more cost effective to begin work on truly addressing these inequities and other social factors than it will be to simply continue to ignore them.